Welcome, I'm Harald Zack. And I'm Mahsa Wafoy. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number four, Ontologies as Key to Knowledge Representation. In this very first part of the lecture, we are going to dive back in history and tell you a little bit about ontologies in computer science. And this goes, as said, from Aristotle to AI. Okay, we have heard about ontologies already in the course of this lecture and you might have wondered what exactly is this kind of a knowledge representation. And we can tell you this, you know, term has a long tradition. It dates back to antiquity and even there in philosophy it has been created. And to tell you more about the history of ontology, I'll give it to Massa. Yes, so the word ontology has its roots in the Greek language. Etymologically, this word consists of two parts. The first part, on, in Greek, is the participle of the verb to be. And the second part, logia, means science. So to give the etymological definition of ontology, that would be the science of being or the science of existence. Now, if you look at the Wikipedia definition of ontology, it is quite similar philosophical study of the nature of being, existence or reality, as well as the basic categories of being and their relations. So in general, the um, ontology in philosophy deals with general questions such as what does exist or what can be said to exist. This term for the first time appears in 1606 in a book called Ogdoas Scholastica by Jakob Lorad. And then again, in 1613, the term appears in a book by Rudolf Gerkel called Lexicon Philosophicum, which is an encyclopedia of philosophy. Now, ontology in philosophy tries to answer some fundamental philosophical questions, such as what does it mean for being to be? This question can be, of course, broken down into several questions, such as when are two things identical? Is everything that exists also real? Does something exist if it is only possible? Are there non-existing things? And the second major question in ontology, which is basically a general kind of uh, metaphysics, it's asking what categories of objects do exist. So what they want to do is they want to put the things and in the entire world into single categories to better understand the world. So therefore, they are asking things like, for example, do things exist that are only unique or only multiple? So this is a question about universalia. Or do things exist that are unilaterally dependent on each other? So the so-called substances. Of which sort then is this dependency that would be causality? And do necessary property exists? So we are asking about essences. And how do composed things relate to their components? So these are basic questions for ontology. Yeah, and uh, if we look back in history, as I already told you, um, the term ontology has been introduced somewhere in the 1600s. Before that, of course, people were also already doing ontology because it studies the world, the nature of being. And this dates back to Greek philosophy and the main proponents there were Plato, so he's a predecessor then of Aristotle, and Aristotle really did then exactly these categories that you see here. He came up with the first, we call that an upper ontology, where he tried to put all the things in the world into a category system. So this was done by Aristotle. Okay, so let's continue. However, today in computer science, we have a different definition for an ontology. According to Thomas Gruber, in the 1990s, an ontology is an explicit formal specification of a shared conceptualization. Okay, this definition doesn't sound so easy to grasp, so let's have a look at each of the words that are appearing in this definition of an ontology. First of all, an ontology is a kind of conceptualization. What is a conceptualization? A conceptualization basically is an abstract model that tries to describe a particular domain. And of course, in its attempt to describe this domain, it has to identify the relevant concepts and relations in this domain. Okay, then we go to the word explicit. 
An ontology has to be explicit. This means the meaning of all concepts must be defined. There cannot be concepts the meaning of which are left undefined in an ontology. An ontology has to be formal. And of course, this means it has to be machine understandable. The machine has to be able to interpret an ontology. And finally, it has to be shared. If an ontology is not shared, then it is only useful for the creators of the ontology. And there has to be some consensus about the ontology so that it can be used by other persons as well. Exactly. So now let's ask ourselves, how do we represent these ontologies? So what are the building blocks that you're going to need? And we have already learned about that in the first lectures when we were talking about classes, relations, relations and instances. And this exactly is what we are going to do here again. So we need classes, so abstract groups, sets or collection of individuals or objects to represent ontology concepts. Those classes usually are characterized by our attributes. Attributes are nothing else here than named value pairs. And these kind of descriptions, class descriptions, can be rather informal. For example, you see here an informal description of what is a philosopher. They can also be semi-formal, so you have a philosopher and then you give simply all of the attributes of the philosopher, of course, a first name, a surname, address, number of publications, impact factor, and what else is important nowadays for a philosopher. That's a semi-formal description. But in the end, we want to go to a formal description, which means that it's based on formal mathematical logic. However, these were the classes. Let's continue with relations. OK, yes. So there are also some special attributes that relate the two classes to one another. Here, for example, you can see that the class scientist is connected to the class publication via a special attribute publication. We call these special attributes relations. Relations are attributes whose values are objects of other classes. As another example of a relation, you can see the subclass of. Here, scientist is a subclass of occupation, and these two classes are connected via the relation subclass of to one another. OK, and to make these relations more expressive, what we can do for relations and attributes, we can define rules and constraints that have to be followed. So one of the things we can do, for example, that you see here, so let me quickly switch on the laser pointer. You see here we have numerical restrictions, which means here n persons are connected to potentially m occupations, which means a person can have many occupations as well as an occupation can be carried out, the same one by many different persons. Or here we have a one-to-one -one relation between scientist and occupation. Or we have, an, again, a many-to-many -many relation between scientist and research tool, meaning a scientist can use several research tools or the same research tool can be used by several scientists. So this would be a specific form of constraint. Another constraint that is given in terms of a rule, we already have heard about that, is the disjunction. So for example, persons and publications they have nothing in common in the sense, of course, a person can never be at the same time a publication. So therefore, these two classes are to be disjunctive. OK, so um, in the world of ontologies, classes, relations, and constraints can all be combined together to form more complex statements or assertions. But there is one special case of constraints that are called formal axioms. Axioms describe knowledge that cannot be expressed simply with the help of other existing components. These are special kind of constraints. And um, an example of these um, axioms would be a philosopher is somebody who knows himself. The components of the existing ontology cannot express this knowledge, so we try to um, keep it in our ontology with the help of an axiom. OK, and of course, our ontology has to be populated. So we need instances, so individuals that populate then these classes. And we distinguish here, for example, Plato, who is a philosopher and a person. So his occupation is philosopher. But uh, of course, he is of type person. And a person usually has an occupation and a name. And therefore, also Plato has an occupation and a name. And uh, as we already told you, these 
assertions here with the individuals. This part of a knowledge base usually is called A box for assertional knowledge. And the other side here, T box, with all of the schema data that we have here and the classes and relations. So this is the terminological knowledge and the T box. Okay, so far so good. In the next part of the lecture, we will tell you about the crucial role of mathematical logic.